Section 15 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin a wonderful example of science and skill in the preceding chapter reference was made to the fact that for the successful sending of pictures by wire one thing was necessary above all others that one thing consists in making two machines perhaps a hundred of miles apart start working together stop together and when working turn at exactly the same speed let the reader just picture the problem to himself and ask himself how such an arrangement can be possible let him think of a town two hundred miles away and then meditate on the possibility of making a machine working in his own room and another in that distant town maintain perfect unanimity in their movements the result of such reflection will probably be the assertion that such a thing is beyond the bounds of possibility. Then he will find the following description of how it is done extremely interesting. In the first place, it must be understood that each machine is driven by an electric motor. The motors are designed to run at 3,000 revolutions per minute and they drive the cylinders of the machines through gearing so arranged that the latter turns at fifty revolutions per minute now all machines perhaps the most docile and easily managed is the direct current electric motor each such machine is made with a view to its working at a certain speed but that can be varied within certain limits by simply varying the force of the current which drives it and that force can be very easily varied by the use of an instrument called a rheostat or variable resistance we are all familiar with the way in which the engine driver regulates the speed of a locomotive by means of a valve in the steam pipe the opening and closing more or less of the valve enables the speed to be changed at will and adjusted to a nicety the rheostat is to the electric current what the valve is to the steam. It can be opened and closed, more or less, as necessary. By it the current driving the motor can be made stronger or weaker, and as that change is made so does the speed of the motor change accordingly. Thus we see that there is at hand the means of setting a motor to work at any desired speed. The difficulty, however, is to tell when the desired speed has been attained. One can count the revolutions of a machine at two or three revolutions per minute with a certain amount of accuracy, but fifty revolutions per minute are more than one could count correctly still less could we count the three thousand revolutions every minute of the motors thus even if we had the two motors side by side we should have extreme difficulty in making them work at the same speed exactly one might be doing three thousand while the other did two thousand nine hundred and ninety or three thousand and ten and we should be none the wiser and when we separate the two by a distance of many miles the task of synchronizing them is even worse but fortunately there is a simple contrivance by which we can tell very accurately the speed of a motor the reader has already been familiarized in previous chapters with the difference between direct or continuous electric currents and alternating ones it is the continuous sort which is used to drive these motors but a slight addition to the machine will make it so that while direct current is put in to drive it alternating current can be drawn out of it two little insulated metal rings are fitted 
hooked on to the spindle of the machine, and these are connected in certain ways to the wires of the motor. Then against these rings, as they turn, there rub two little metal arms called, because of their sweeping action, brushes, and from these brushes we can draw the alternating current. For our present purpose the importance of this lies in the fact that the rate at which the current will alternate depends upon the speed of the motor. As the motor increases or decreases in speed, so will the rate of the alternation increase or decrease. So that if we can measure the rate at which the current drawn from the motor is alternating, we shall know from that the rate at which the machine is working. This we can do by the aid of the frequency meter. The working of this is based upon the acting of a tuning fork. Everyone knows that a given tuning fork always gives out the same note. The note depends upon the rate at which the fork vibrates, and the reason that one fork always gives the same note is because it always vibrates at the same rate. That rate, in turn, depends upon its length. If one were to file a little off the end of a tuning fork, the note would be raised, because its rate of vibration would become faster. Similarly, lengthening the fork would result in a lower note being given. Thus, a tuning fork, or any bar of steel held by one end and free to vibrate at the other, gives a standard of speed which is very reliable, and it so happens that we can easily use a set of such forks to test the rate of alternation of an alternating current. Generally speaking, alternating current is no use for energizing a magnet. The chief reason for that is that the current tends to get choked up, as it were, in the coil. Alternating current traverses a coil very reluctantly indeed. It is, however, possible to make an electric magnet of special design which will work sufficiently well with alternating current to answer our present purpose. And it will be clear that just as the alternating current itself consists of a series of short currents, so the force of the magnet will be intermittent. It will give not a steady pull, as is usually the case with magnets, but a succession of little tugs. There will, in fact, be one tug for every alternation of the current. A simple form of motor fitted up as just described and rotating at 3,000 revolutions per minute would give out 100 alternations per second. If, then, such current were employed to energize a magnet, that magnet would give 100 tugs per second. So a small steel bar of the right length to give 100 vibrations per second can be fixed with its free end nearly touching such a magnet, and when the current is turned on it will very soon be vibrating vigorously, for the tugs of the magnet will agree with the natural rate of vibration of the bar, and just as the two pendulums described in chapter 12 responded readily to each other, so the bar responds readily to the pulls of the magnet, but increase or decrease the rate of alternation ever so slightly, and the sympathy between magnet and bar is destroyed. The bar will not respond. It will only answer when the pulls of the magnet and the natural rate of vibration of the bar exactly correspond. So it is usual to place five or six such bars with their ends near one magnet. The lengths of the bars vary slightly, so that the rates of vibration are, say, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, respectively. Let us, in imagination, adjust the speed of a supposed tuitous motor until we get that which corresponds to 100 alternations. We switch on the current and at first, possibly, we get no response from 
any of the vibrating bars. Just a touch to the handle of the rheostat, and we notice that bar 102 shows signs of life. We see then that our speed was much too fast, and that reducing it has brought it down to 102, which is still a little too fast. Just a little more movement of the handle, and 102 begins to relapse into quiet, while 101 shows animation. A little more movement, and 101 gives place to 100, and then we know that our motor is working at the desired speed. If our motor has been too slow to commence with, it would have been 98 which first got into action, but the method of adjustment would have been precisely the same. And thus we see the whole scheme. We regulate the speed by the rheostat, and meanwhile the tell-tale stream of alternating current comes flowing out of the motor to indicate to us what the speed is, what the frequency meter, with its various vibrating bars, interprets to us the message which the alternating current brings to us. So by watching the meter we know when we have got the speed that we desire. But even that is only half the battle. We have seen how to make a machine turn at any desired speed, and so we can adjust any two so that they revolve at the same speed. But we have not seen how to start and stop the two machines at the same time. First of all, it must be understood that in the case of the receiving machines, there is a friction clutch as it is termed between the motor and the cylinder which it is driving. That means that while, under ordinary circumstances, the motor drives the cylinder round, we can, if we like, hold the latter still without stopping the motor. When we do, the connection be between the two simply slips. So if we fit a catch on the cylinder which is capable of holding it from rotating, we can still start the motor and the latter will work. Then, the moment the catch is released, the cylinder will begin to turn too. The commonest form of a friction drive is the flat leather belt upon two pulleys, which everyone has seen at some time or another in a factory, and it will be quite easy to conceive how, if one of the driven machines were to stick, the belt might simply slip upon one of the pulleys, yet, as soon as the machine be becomes free again, it would rotate just as it did before. It is just the same with what we are considering. The motor works continuously at its proper speed, but the cylinder can be stopped when desired by the catch. Combined with the catch is an electromagnet, and though its coils there flows the current of electricity which is engaged in printing the picture on the cylinder. If a magnet be arranged to attract another magnet, it will do so only when the energizing ener current flows one way. When it flows the other way, it does not attract. Therefore, it is easy to arrange matters so that the printing current, though passing through the coil of the magnet, shall not pull open the catch. But if that current be reversed in direction for a moment, the magnet gives a pull, open flies the catch, and away goes the cylinder upon its revolution. Thus we see all that is necessary to start the receiving cylinder is to reverse the current for a moment. And now let us turn our attention to the sending machine. Upon its cylinder there is an arrangement which automatically reverses the current flowing to the main wire once in every revolution. Normally the current flows to the wire as described in the last chapter, carrying by means of its variations the details of the picture for reproduction by the receiving machine at the other end. But for an instant, once in every resolution, that current is interrupted and a current sent in the opposite direction instead. This the sending machine does itself, quite automatically. 
and now the reader knows of all the apparatus it remains only to see how the different parts work in combination standing by the sending machine we first of all turn on the current which goes coursing along the wire to the distant station then we set the motor to work and the cylinder begins to rotate before it has completed a single revolution the reverser is operated and just for a moment the reverse current goes to the wire on arrival at the other end that lifts the catch and the receiving cylinder starts that first partial revolution of the sending cylinder counts for nothing real business begins when the reverser first acts and that is the moment when the receiving cylinder also begins to move similarly when the sending cylinder stops it sends no more reverse currents and so the receiving cylinder is caught by the catch and not released so starting and stopping are quite automatic the same arrangement enables a continual readjustment of the relative speed of the two cylinders to take place with all the best devices the tuning forks and the rest it is still impossible to attain perfect unanimity but the variation in a single revolution cannot be enough to matter it is only when the error in one revolution goes on multiplying itself that serious difference might arise and that is prevented in the following beautifully simple way the motor which drives the receiving drum is so regulated that it travels slightly faster than does the other thus the receiving cylinder completes every revolution slightly in advance of the other and consequently is stopped and held by the catch every time the catch retains of course until the reverse current arrives and releases it thus not only does the sending cylinder start the other when the operation first commence but it does so every revolution every revolution therefore the two cylinders start together so the two cylinders are set according to the frequency meter at as nearly as possible exactly the correct speeds and the action of the reverser the reverse current and the catch ensures quite automatically that at the commencement of every revolution there shall be perfect agreement between the two no accumulation of errors can possibly occur and the problem though apparently so difficult if not insuperable at first sight is surmounted end of section 15 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Section 16 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arvin Sundar from arvinsundar.com. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin. Scientific Testing and Measuring. Science whether it be of the pure variety, that which is pursued for its own sake, for the mere greed for knowledge, or applied science, the purpose of which is to assist manufacture, is based entirely upon accurate testing and measuring. It is only by discovering and investigating small differences in size, weight, or strength that some of the most important facts can be brought to light. There are some problems, too, that defy theory, since they are too complicated. They involve too many theories all at once, and such can only be solved by accurate tests. And all these necessitate the use of very ingenious and often costly devices. Electrical measuring instruments were of sufficient importance and interest to warrant a chapter of their own, but there are many others of great value and not without interest to the general reader. For example, 
Some years ago, there was a collision in the Solent, just off Cowes, between the cruiser Hawk and the giant liner Olympic. The cause of this was a subject of dispute and of litigation. The theorists theorized, some reached the conclusion that the Hawk was to blame, and others the Olympic. And where doctors disagree, who shall decide? It was wisely decreed that tests should be made to settle the question. The main point was this. The officers of the Hawk, by far the smaller vessel, averred that they were drawn out of their course by suction caused by the movement of so large a ship as the Olympic in the comparatively narrow and shallow waters of the Solent. In other words, that the Olympic in moving through the water caused a swirling, eddying motion in the water, tending to draw a lighter vessel towards itself. And that is just one of those problems with which theory is unable to deal. So it was transferred to the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington, near London, for investigation by experiment. At this institution, which is a semi-national one, there is a tank constructed for the purposes such as this. The word tank leads us to underestimate its size somewhat, for it is 494 feet long and 30 feet wide. It is solidly constructed of concrete, with a miniature set of docks at one end and a sloping beach at the other. On either side are rails upon which run trolleys which support the ends of a bridge which spans the hole. This bridge can be propelled along by means of electric motors operating the wheels of the trolleys, from one end of the tank to the other, at any desired speed, within, of course, reasonable limits, and from it may be towed any model which it is desired to test. The models used are usually made of wax, by means of a machine specially designed for the purpose. It should be explained that the plans of a ship consist of a series of curves, each of which represents the contour of the vessel at one particular height. For example, if you can imagine a ship cut horizontally into slices of uniform thickness, then each slice could be shown on the drawing, the shear plan, as it is termed, by a curved line. Near the keel, the lines would, of course, be almost straight, but they would bulge more and more as they occur higher up. And what this machine is required to do is to make, quickly and economically, a wax model which shall be an exact reproduction, on a small scale, of the vessel under discussion. It may be, it most often is, a ship as yet unbuilt, the behavior of which it is desired to test, or it may be an existing vessel, as it was in the case mentioned just now. However that may be, the model is made from the drawings. A block of wax rests upon a table, while the drawing is spread upon a board nearby. A pointer is moved by hand along one of the lines, and its movement is repeated by a rapidly revolving cutter, which cuts away the wax to a similar curve. By suitable adjustments, the cutter can be made to magnify or reduce the size, so as to produce any desired scale. Thus, every line is gone over and a similar curve cut in the wax at the correct height. Of course, this only produces a lump of wax shaped in steps, as it were, but it is then quite easy to trim it down by hand, so as to produce a smooth model of the ship, perfectly accurate in its shape, and a copy on a small scale of the vessel portrayed on the drawing. Can also be hollowed out, ballasted with weights inside, and so made to sink to any desired level, thereby representing the vessel when fully loaded, half loaded, and so on. All sorts of unequal loading can be produced if needed. Indeed, every condition of the real ship can be imitated in the model. It can then be towed to and fro in the tank by the travelling carriage described above. The speed of the towing can be varied by changing the speed of the motors which drive it. The force needed to pull the model through the water is measured by means of a dynamometer which registers the pull on the towing apparatus. A matter very often needing investigation is the shape and size of the wave thrown up by the bow of the vessel and of that left behind her, known as the bow wave and the stern wave, respectively. These waves represent wasted energy, for they are no use and are produced actually by the power of the engines of the ship 
as they drive her along. The ideal ship would cause no waves, but since that is a degree of perfection impossible even to hope for, the shipbuilder has to content himself by so designing his ships that these waves shall be as small as possible. The waves are recorded photographically, in some cases by the kinematograph. Some of the large shipbuilders have their own tanks, and so have the naval authorities of the great naval powers. The one at Teddington was established through the munificence of a famous British shipbuilder, Mr. Yarrow, who not only defrayed the cost of construction, but gave an endowment to assist in its upkeep. It is intended to serve the needs of the smaller builders who have not tanks of their own, and also for the investigation of matters of general interest to shipbuilders, and for such tests as that relating to the Hawk and Olympic. In this last-named case, of course, two models were made, one to represent each ship, and they were towed along in such a way as to imitate very closely the movements of the ships at the time when they collided. It was as the result of these tests that the Olympic was ordered to pay damages to the Admiralty, it being held that she was the cause of the accident. A very interesting investigation of this kind was recently carried out in the tank at the United States Navy Yard. The port of New York consists very largely of jetties projecting out from the banks of the river. With the growth of the Atlantic liner, the old jetties had become too short, and the questions arose as to the elongation of them. If it were done, how would it affect the current in the river and the handling of shipping generally? If, on the other hand, it were not done, what would be the effect of the ships lying with their ends projecting out into the stream unprotected by a jetty? To determine these points, the experimental tank was converted into a model of the New York Harbor, or at all events of that part in connection with which these questions arose. A false floor was put in so as to make the depth exactly right in proportion to the width. Little model jetties were arranged to represent exactly the real ones, while against them were moored modeled vessels so that the effect upon them could be observed as the model of the large vessel was towed past. In addition to this, special appliances were arranged for finding out what the disturbance might be which the movement of a giant liner produces under the surface as well as above it. For this purpose, buoyant balls were employed, moored at various distances below the surface, from which thin rods projected upwards the movement of which rendered visible the movements of the submerged balls and therefore the effects of the underwater currents. All these things had to be observed at one and the same time, the moving model itself, the models alongside the jetties, the commotion on the surface, the swayings to and fro of the rods attached to the submerged floats all, or most of which, at all events, it was impossible to make self-recording. Yet, seeing that it was of the utmost importance that the relations between all these recordings should be observed and recorded from time to time as the model was towed along, it is evident that something must be done, and a cunning use of the kinematograph solved the problem quite easily. At various points, commanding a good view of the model harbor and its shipping, these machines were placed. And so, several series of photographs were obtained, and by the study of which all the different movements could be seen and compared. A large dial, too, was rigged up upon the traveling carriage by which the model was towed, a finger on which denoted the distance which the carriage had traveled at any moment. This large dial came into each photograph, of course, and so each picture bore upon itself a clear record of that particular moment in the voyage of the model to which it referred. Thus we see an instance of how the very latest and most up-to-date methods of amusement are sometimes applied to serve very practical purposes. Akin to the experiments upon ships are aerial experiments to determine matters connected with the navigation of the air. At Barrows in Furness, the great firm of vicars, shipbuilders and armament manufacturers, and laterally builders of aerial craft for the British Admiralty, have erected a machine for testing the efficiency of aerial propellers and other things of a kindred nature. 
Upon the top of a tall tower, there is pivoted a long arm of light iron framework. To the end of this, a propeller can be fixed, so that as the arm revolves, there is produced almost exactly the same conditions as those which prevail when a propeller drives an aeroplane or a steerable balloon. By means of suitable mechanism, the propeller can be turned at any desired speed, with the result that it drives the arm round and round upon its pivot on the top of the tower. The force which the propeller thus exerts can easily be measured, and so can be determined such questions as the most efficient speed for each type of propeller, the power which any particular one can develop, the best form for each particular need, and so on. Materials, too, require the most careful testing, in order that they may be put to the best possible use in modern machinery and structures. For example, anyone can measure the strength of a spring, but what do we know as to its lasting power? Springs often have to form part of a machine in which they are stretched and compressed millions of times, and the question arises as to what is the best shape and material for the purpose. It may be that the spring which works best a few times will be the first to become weary, for with repeated strain such things as steel get tired, just as the human frame does. Now that is a matter which will yield to no calculation. The only way to determine it is actual test. So a mechanism has to be employed which will extend and compress the spring over and over again, just as it will be in actual use, with a counter of the nature of a cyclometer to count how many times it has been subjected to this distortion. Then the apparatus is set going and left to itself for hours, or even days, during which time it may work the spring millions of times. This may go on until it breaks, or else it may be done a pre-arranged number of times, and then the spring taken out and tested by other means to see how its strength has been affected. Metal bars are often subjected to sudden blows, light in themselves, but oft repeated. The point to be determined then is how many times the blow may fall before permanent injury is done to the bar. To investigate such matters, we have the repeated impact machine. The bar is held in a suitable holder under a hammer which gives it a blow, the force of which can be easily regulated at regular intervals, the number of blows being counted by a suitable recording mechanism. Ultimately, the bar breaks, under a blow the like of which it can endure singly without any apparent strain at all. The machine, by the way, can be caused to turn the bar round to some degree after each blow, so that it is struck from all directions in succession. The microscope, too, has established its place in the testing laboratory. It is a very valuable adjunct to chemical and mechanical tests. Suppose, for example, that a bar of steel is being investigated. It can be put into a machine and pulled until it breaks in two. The machine registers the amount of the pull which was applied. Or a small piece can be put under a press and compressed to any desired degree. It can also be tested by impact or even pulled apart by a sudden blow, as described in mechanical inventions of today. The bar can be supported by its ends and loaded or pulled down in the center, so that its power of resisting bending can be determined. It can be judged, too, from its chemical composition. Steel, in particular, depends for its properties very largely upon its chemical composition. The difference between cast iron, wrought iron, and steel, also the differences between the innumerable varieties of steel, are due almost entirely to the admixture of a certain percentage of carbon with the metal. This can be ascertained by chemical analysis. This form of inquiry has the advantage over the more purely mechanical methods in that the latter, for the most part, have to be applied to the bar as a whole whereas the quality may vary in different parts, the surface in particular being liable to differ from the interior. In such cases, one analysis can be made of a piece cut from the surface and another of a piece cut from the center. And it is here, too, that microscopical analysis comes in. For this purpose, a piece is sawn off the bar and the end ground perfectly smooth. 
This is then washed in a suitable chemical, such as a mild acid, which acts differently upon the different materials of which the metal is built up, thereby rendering them visible one from another. A photograph taken through a microscope then shows the structure of the metal, how the different constituents are built together. This is known as metallographic testing, and its advantage, as compared with chemical analysis, is that the latter shows, as we might say, what are the bricks of which the thing is built, while the former shows how the bricks are arranged. Indeed, it is hardly correct to speak of the advantage or superiority of one over the other, since each is the complement of the other, supplying the information which the other fails to give. And there are other mechanical tests which have not yet been mentioned. There are machines which twist a bar so as to discover its power to resist torsion. There are others which apply a downward pressure on one part of the bar and an upward one on an adjacent part, so as to show its capabilities in withstanding shearing strain. Moreover, many of these tests are nowadays, in a well-equipped testing house, carried out in conjunction with the use of heat. It stands to reason that a part of a machine which will have to work under considerable heat may have to be of different material from a part which works under a normal temperature. In some cases, the bar is surrounded by a spiral wire through which electric current is passing, and by the regulation of this current, any desired temperature can be set up in the bar. Or it may be applied in a bath of hot oil in such a way that the bar shall be raised to any temperature required without interfering with the machinery which exerts the tension or pressure, or whatever it be. Years ago, such elaborate tests as these were never thought of. There are certain well-known figures to be found in all engineering textbooks which give what stresses different materials ought to be able to stand, and these were, and are still, to a large extent, relied upon, it being taken for granted that the material used will be up to the average standard. In large and important works, however, the testing has been developed upon scientific lines, so that it is known from actual experiment what each particular thing is capable of. This not only means security, but economy, for it is sometimes found that a substance is stronger than it is thought to be, and so things made of it can be designed to give the requisite strength lighter and cheaper than they would have been otherwise. Some of the machines employed are of enormous strength, capable of exerting a pull or a compression of, it may be, 100 tons or more. They are often made, too, with self-recording appliances, whereby the course of the test is set down automatically upon a chart. For example, when a bar is being tested for tension, it is desirable to know not only the actual pull under which it came into, but the behavior of the test piece during the period before that. It begins to stretch as soon as the tension is applied, theoretically at all events, and if the metal were perfectly ductile, it would stretch continuously as the load increases, until at last the breaking stress is reached. But in actual practice, it probably stretches somewhat by fits and starts, and a record of that fact will be of great value in estimating the strength of the material in actual work. For such, an automatically made record, which can be studied at leisure, is of the utmost importance. But perhaps the finest instance of scientific methods in manufacture is to be found in the methods by which standard parts of machines are measured, so as to ensure that they shall be interchangeable. It may surprise the casual reader to be told that an absolutely exact measurement is an impossibility. It is safe to say that out of a million similar articles, articles made with the intention that they shall be exactly alike, there are no two which are, in fact, absolutely similar. They may be made with the same machines and the same tools, handled by the same man, but machines and tools wear or get out of adjustment, while man's liability to err is proverbial. Astronomers are the greatest experts in the art of measurements, and they recognize the possibility, nay, the probability of error so frankly as to make every measurement several times over. If it be an important one, they make it, if possible, a great many times over, and then take the average of the results. 
By this means, they eliminate, to a certain extent at any rate, the error which cannot be avoided. That process is to allow for errors on the part of their instruments, for the most part. To deal with personal errors, another method is used as well, for it is known that some observers have a natural tendency to err on one side more or less, while others tend to make mistakes in some degree on the other side. This tendency to err is known as the personal equation of the observer, and there are machines and tests by which the personal equation of each man can be determined, or perhaps it would be more correct to say estimated, so that in all observations made by him, the proper allowance can be added or deducted. But of course, it would be extremely difficult to apply such methods in a workshop. It would never do to have to measure everything several times over hoping that the average would come out in such manner as to indicate that the thing being measured was the size required. Instead, therefore, of wasting time seeking an accuracy which is known to be unattainable, the manufacturing engineer adopts a scientific system of measurement wherein a certain amount of inaccuracy is determined upon as permissible. And then, simple appliances are used to see that it is, in fact, fall within those limits. For instance, a round bar is to be made, say, an inch in diameter. Now, we know from what has just been said that, when made, we have no means of telling whether the bar is really and truly an inch in diameter or not. We consider, then, what it is for, and decide, say, that it will be near enough so long as we are sure that it is not larger than one inch plus one thousandth, nor less than one inch minus one thousandth. So long as it does not exceed or fall short of its reputed size by more than one thousandth of an inch, then we know that it will answer its purpose. Now having come to that decision, we can build up a system upon which any intelligent workman can proceed, with the result that all the inch bars which he makes will be the same size within the limits of one over one thousand, over or under, so that the greatest possible difference between any two will be 1 over 500. This system involves the use of two gauges for every size. The man employed upon making 1 inch bars has a plate with a hole in it 11 over 1000 inches in diameter and another hole 999 over 1000 of an inch in diameter. One of these is the go-in gauge, the other is the not go in, so that all he has to do in order to be quite sure that his work is right is to see that it can be poked through one of these holes, but not through the other. No trouble at all, it will be observed, adjusting fine measuring appliances, simply a plate with two holes in it, and the workman can be sure that he is turning our articles, every one of which is practically correct, with no variation beyond a slight inequality too small to matter. And probably at some other part of the factory, there is a man making articles, each of which has a hole in it, into which this bar must fit. How does he manage? He is provided with a gauge somewhat the shape of a dumbbell, one end of which is slightly larger than the other. One is the go-in end, and the other is the not-go-in end. If the hole which he makes will permit the former to enter, but will refuse admittance to the latter, then he knows that that hole is sufficiently near its reputed size to answer its purpose. In the instances mentioned, a thousandth of an inch either way has been mentioned as the limit of inaccuracy, or the tolerance as it is sometimes termed, but often the limits are much narrower than that. The gauges themselves are a case in point, for they must be true within, say, a ten thousandth or even less, and they too are checked by master gauges of a finer degree of accuracy still, being made by the most laborious methods, and checked over and over again, so as to reach the utmost limits in the way of correctness. So this methodical scientific system of limit gauges is based upon the principle of having one gauge limiting the error one way and another defining it in the other. Anything simpler or more effective it would be impossible to conceive. It is due very largely to this system that many manufactured articles are now so much cheaper than they used to be. 
for it enables each individual part to be made wholesale on a large scale by machines specifically adapted to the work, operated by men specially trained to work on them, with the practical certainty that these parts, when assembled together, will fit each other. In conclusion, there is another very interesting instrument which was first made for a purely utilitarian use, namely the investigation of the methods of making colored glass, but which has since been applied to some interesting problems in pure science. It is called the ultramicroscope. It must first be pointed out that there is a limit to the power of the ordinary microscope, beyond which the skill of the optician cannot go. He is baffled at that point not because of any lack of ability on his own part, but because of the nature of light itself. An opaque object, unless it be self-luminous, which few things are, can only be seen by reflected light. Generally speaking, we see things because they reflect in some degree the light which falls upon them. But light consists of waves, and when we reach an object so minute that its diameter is about half the wavelength of light, then we cannot see it because it is unable to reflect the light on account of its smallness. We can see this any day by the seaside, or by a river or a large pond. There it is evident that waves and ripples are reflected by such things as large stones, wood posts, or anything of any size which come in their way. But when a wave encounters an object much smaller than itself, it simply swallows it up, as it were, flows all over it or around it without being in any way reflected by it. And it is just the same with the waves of light. They are unaffected by obstacles below a certain size, and so are not reflected by them. For this reason, things smaller than about a seven thousandth of a millimeter cannot possibly be seen by a microscope in the ordinary way. But if an object can be made self-luminous, then it can be seen, whatever its size, if the magnifying power of the microscope be great enough. So this ultramicroscope, as it is called, is really an ordinary microscope of the highest power possible, with an added apparatus for making the tiny particles which are being sought for self-luminous. This is done by directing upon them a pencil of light of exceeding intensity. Generated by powerful arc lamps, the light is concentrated by a system of lenses until it is, of an almost incredible brightness, after which it falls upon the object. Now at first sight, this seems to be no different from the usual procedure with a microscope, and there appears to be no reason why it should be more successful. But the explanation is this. Light is a form of energy, and the waves of this very intense beam falling upon the object throw it into a state of violent agitation, by virtue of which it shines, not with reflected light, but with light of its own. It is not that the waves are reflected, but that they so shake up the particle that it gives off light waves itself, and thus it comes within the range of human vision. In this way, not only have the very small particles of coloring matter and glass been seen individually, but it is thought that the actual molecules of matter have been seen, or if not the molecules individually, little groups of molecules, dancing and capering about, just as scientific people for years have believed them to be doing, although they could not see them. So here we have an instance in which manufacture has aided science, an inversion of the usual order of things. End of section 16. Recording by Arvind Sundar from arvindsundar.com Section 17 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin. Color Photography. Photography has introduced many of the general public to a branch of practical science which otherwise they would never have cared much about. The action of light upon certain chemicals, 
the subsequent action upon the same of other chemicals such as developers toning solutions and so on form a very well-known region of the domain of science and this is too a branch of chemistry in which the practical inventor has been very busy the efforts therefore which have been made to invent ways of producing photographic pictures which shall give to the objects their natural colors will probably be of special interest in a book like this of these there are two very well known systems and to them we will mainly confine our attention it should first be pointed out however that what we are discussing is quite different from the simple orthochromatic plates which are used by many photographers these latter are coated somewhat differently from other plates with a view to their giving a more realistic picture but the result is still in one color they are in fact a little more sensitive to differences in color than ordinary plates so that colors which appear when the latter are used very much the same appear when orthochromatic plates are employed a little different but the difference in color in the object photographed is only even then represented by a difference in shade in the picture the object is it may be in many colors in all the colors very likely but the picture is only in one and the step from that to a colored picture is a very long one true the solution of the problem is a very simple in principle yet the practical difficulties are so great that even now they have not been entirely overcome let us first of all examine the principle sunlight by which photographs are usually taken appears to the eye white and colorless it is not really so however as can be proved by analyzing it with the spectroscope in this instrument a flat beam of light having passed through a narrow slit falls upon a prism of glass from which it emerges as a broad band known as the spectrum this band can be seen upon a screen or can be examined through a telescope so far from being white and colorless it consists of the most lovely colors at one end of the spectrum is a beautiful red which as the eye travels along imperceptibly merges into orange which in turns merges into yellow after which we find green blue indigo and violet in the order named these seven are known as the primary colors but it is quite a mistake to suppose that there are seven clearly defined and distinct colors the colors so change one into another that their number is really infinite the seven names indicate seven points in the spectrum whereat the colors are sufficiently distinct from others to warrant a separate name being given to them we call the starting color red for example and as we pass our eyes along we perceive a constant change and when that change has become sufficiently pronounced to justify our doing so we call the new color orange continuing we find the orange changing into something else and when it has gone far enough we bring in a third name yellow and so on to the violet thus we see the division into seven colors is arbitrary and only for our own convenience since the whole number of colors is innumerable passing through a prism is not however the only means by which white light can be split up when the sun shines upon a blue flower for instance the blue petals perform a partial separation they reflect the blue part of the sunlight and absorb all the rest a red flower likewise reflects the red part of the sunlight and absorbs the rest it is because things can thus discriminate reflecting some kinds of light and absorbing the remainder that we perceive things in different colors it follows therefore that when we look upon a landscape 
or a field of flowers, we receive into our eyes an enormous variety of colored lights. The whitest sunlight furnishes each thing we see with a flood of, of white light, and each thing according to its nature reflects more or less. A white flower reflects the whole, a pure black object reflects none, but the great majority of things reflect some part or another of that infinite variety of which white light really consists. So a view at all varied sends to our eyes a variety of colors, almost as manifold as the colors of the spectrum, which, as has been said, are infinite and the task of reproducing them or even of producing a similar general effect upon a piece of paper seems at first sight beyond the bounds of possibility but fortunately there is a way by which we can produce approximately at all events the intermediate colors by mixtures of the others the second color of the spectrum for example orange can be obtained by mixing its neighbors on either hand, namely red and yellow. We can, indeed, imitate very closely the imperceptible change from red to yellow through orange by skillful mixture of red and yellow pigments. First there is the pure red, then just a suggestion of yellow is added. More and more yellow brings us to orange after which by gradually diminishing the amount of red we reach the pure yellow. Next, by introducing blue pigment, we can gradually change the yellow into green, and further manipulation of the same two colors will lead us on to pure blue. Indeed, by mixtures of red, yellow, and blue, we can obtain almost all the perceptible varieties of color. And it must be remembered that when, by mixing blue and yellow pigments, we get the effect of green, that is only the result of an optical illusion, the particles of which the yellow pigment is made remain yellow, and the particles of the blue remain blue. The one sort reflect yellow light to our eyes, the other sort reflect blue light, and owing to what in one sense may be called a defect in our vision, these two mingling together look as if the whole were green. In the spectrum we see real green light. From green paint made by mixing yellow and blue, we only see an imitation of artificial green. If the particles were large enough, we should see the yellow and the blue ones quite separate. But since they are too small for us to see at all, except in the mass, our eyes blend the whole together into the intermediate color. Thus we see that, although the variety of colors is infinite, we can for practical purposes reproduce as much difference as our eyes can perceive by the judicious blending of three, namely red, yellow, and blue. And there is a further fortunate fact. We can filter light. The red glass with which the photographer covers his dark room lamp looks red and throws a red light into the room because it is acting as a filter to the light processing from the lamp behind it. The lamp is sending out light of many colors, but the glass is only transparent to the red. It holds up all the others but lets the red pass freely. So if we were to take a photograph through a red screen, we should get on the plate only those parts which were more or less red in color. For example, if we thus photographed a group of three flowers, one red, one orange, and one yellow, the red one would come out prominently the orange one would come out faintly and the yellow one not at all. Then suppose we took the same picture again through a yellow screen. In that case the yellow flower would be prominent, the orange one again would be faint, but the red one would be absent. Having got, in an imagination, two such negatives, let's make two carbon prints, one off each 
and let the print off the first negative be red while that off the second is yellow let each be in fact of the same color as the screen through which the picture was taken finally let the two films be placed in contact one upon the other on holding the two up to the light what should we see we should see a red flower for there would be a red flower clearly defined upon one film coinciding with a blank transparent space upon the other film we should see too a yellow flower for a clearly defined yellow flower on the second film would coincide with a clear space upon the first we should see also an orange colored flower for there would be a faint red image of it and a faint yellow image of it one on each film lying one over the other producing the same effect as a mixture of yellow and red pigments thus by taking two negatives through two colored screens and then coloring the prints to correspond we can obtain three colors in the finished picture by taking a third negative through a blue screen we could add immensely to the range of colors obtainable indeed with three films red yellow and blue respectively made through three screens of the same color a variety of colors practically infinite can be obtained so the principle is quite simple the difficulty is in carrying it out for the three kinds of light have not the same photographic power and so to avoid upsetting the balance of the colors different exposures would be required for each then there is the difficulty of so manipulating the films as to get them one over another exactly anyone who has tried the handling of carbon prints will readily realize how difficult this would be it is possible and has been done but the process is too uncertain and too laborious to be of general use but the same result can be obtained more or less automatically as the following descriptions will show let us turn to the luminaire autochrome process by which the results desired can be in a large measure attained by methods of manipulation comparatively simple the plates used for this are of a very special nature in the first place there is the basis of glass but upon that there is laid what we might term the selective screen this is a layer of starch grains of exceeding smallness the size of them is as little as half a thousandth of an inch and there are about four million of them on every square inch of plate next upon the screen of starch grains is a layer of waterproof varnish while over that is the ordinary sensitive emulsion such as forms the essential part of the usual non-color plate now the starch grains which form the screen are before they are laid on stained in three colors some are blue some red and some a yellowish green which experience shows is preferable to pure yellow the differently colored grains are well mixed and when the screen is held to the light and looked through the effect is almost that of clear glass that is because red rays from the red grains and green and blue rays from the grains of those colors all proceed to the eye mingled together this plate is placed in the camera differently from the usual way since the glass side is turned towards the lens the light therefore after entering the camera passes through the glass then through the screen and finally falls upon the sensitive film suppose then that the camera were pointed to a red wall red light would fall upon the plate and passing through the red grains would act upon the sensitive film behind them the blue and green grains on the other hand would stop those rays which fell upon them and so those parts of the sensitive film which they cover would remain unaffected by light 
Then, if that plate were to be developed, a dark opaque spot would be produced upon the film under each red grain, the film under the other grains remaining transparent. Hence, when held up to the light and looked through, the plate would appear a greenish blue, for all the red grains would be covered up. In like manner, if the wall were blue instead of red, a greenish red plate would result, while if it were green, the plate would be purple, the result of the combination of red and blue. But this, it will be seen, is a topsy-turvy effect, the exact opposite of what we want, so that it is fortunate that, by a simple chemical method, we can set it right. After a first development in the ordinary way, the plate is placed in another bath and exposed to strong daylight, with the result that those parts which were darkened by the first development become clear and the parts that were clear become opaque. Thus, after this twofold development of the photograph of the red wall, we find ourselves in possession of a red plate in which only the red grains are visible, since all the others are covered up by opaque parts of the sensitive film. The photograph of the blue wall will also, after it has been subjected to the double development, show blue only, and the same with the green. But suppose that instead of a red wall or a blue wall we focus our camera upon one which is half red and half blue. Then it is easy to perceive that we shall get a plate which is half one color and half the other. Moreover, it follows that a wall covered with a mosaic of red, blue, and green would give us a plate duly colored in the same way. But when we go a step further and photograph, say, a landscape, which may contain a vast range of colors, we find a difficulty in believing that they can all be rendered by the simple process of covering or leaving uncovered grains either blue, red, or green. It can be done, however, since the other colors may be made up of two or more of these three in varying proportions. For example, should there be something in the landscape of a darker, more blue shade of green, than the green grains, then the light proceeding from that object, while passing freely through the green grains upon which it falls, will slightly penetrate the neighboring blue ones as well. And so at that point, on the plate, there will be not only green grains visible, but some of the blue grains partly visible also. The light from the blue grains will enter the eye along with that from the green grains, and by so doing will add just that amount of blue to the green as to give it the right shade. After this manner is the whole picture built up. It is, of course, really a mosaic, consisting entirely of little colored patches, but since they are so small, none can be seen individually all merging together in the eye so as to form a picture in which colors change imperceptibly from one into another. To sum up, then, what happens is this. We start with a layer of colored grains. The action of taking and developing the photograph covers up some of the grains and leaves others exposed, and the action of the light is such that those which are left visible produce a picture closely resembling the original, not only in form but in color. But there is one other interesting point about this process which deserves mention. The differently colored lights are not of the same power photographically. Red light, as we know well, is very weak in this respect. Wherefore, we use it in the dark room. A red light will have no perceptible effect upon a plate unless it be exposed to it for some time. Blue light, on the other hand, is very active, and were the blue and red lights to be allowed to act equally on the autochrome plate, 
the result would be much too blue. It is therefore necessary to handicap the blue light, as it were, by placing a reddish yellowish green either just in front of or just behind the lens to cut off a proportion of the blue rays. The other very successful process is known as the Dufay dioptichrome process. It differs very little from the luminaire except in detail, the selective screen being formed of small colored squares instead of by a mass of little grains. In both, it will be noticed the result is a single positive. It is not, as in ordinary photography, a negative off, which any desired number of positive prints can be made, and moreover it is a transparency. It cannot be viewed except by light shining through it. The results are, however, extremely beautiful. When well done and anyone who cares to try either of these methods of working will be well repaid for the trouble involved. End of section 17. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 18 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin. How Science Aids the Stricken Collier. Nothing is more characteristic of the present age than the care which is, quite rightly, expended upon the comfort and safety of those who do the manual labor of the community. The stores of scientific knowledge and skill are drawn upon freely for this end, and some very interesting examples can be given of the truly scientific methods which have been involved not only for preventing injuries of any kind but for the securing those who may despite those precautions fall victims to disease or accident an example has already been given of the scientific investigation into the nature of colliery explosions and the best means of preventing them we have seen there how expense has been poured out lavishly in fitting the experimental gallery or artificial pit and how the most cunning mechanical and electrical devices have been pressed into the service in order to find out just what happens when an explosion occurs it has been related how these investigations have revealed with certainty the true cause of the explosions and thereby led the way to their prevention but with it all there is still an occasional disaster occurring sometimes at the best and most carefully managed collieries and therefore it is still necessary to provide for rescuing the unfortunate men who are affected it is worth remark here that colliery explosions are, all things considered, a very rare occurrence. Because of their dramatic suddenness and the number of lives which are commonly lost in a single disaster, we are apt to magnify their severity in our minds and to picture the life of the miner as a very hazardous one. In point of fact, the expectation of life as the insurance people call it, is quite as great among the coal miners as among any class of manual labor, and of those who do meet an untimely end, there are more lost through isolated accidents involving one or two men than in the great disasters. To meet these isolated cases, science is almost powerless. For the most part, they are due to falls of material from the roof of the mine, or some simple accident of that kind caused by an error of judgment or lack of care on the part of fellow workmen, and the only safeguard against such is the most careful and systematic supervision which, in Great Britain at all events, 
is rigidly applied. The underground staff are very carefully organized with this end in view, and the whole is supervised by government inspectors. No amount of scientific investigation or invention will help much in these matters. With the explosion of fire, however, it is different, for their subtle forces and strange chemical influences come into play with which science is specially well fitted to deal. To a great many, to a great many people the first news of organized, trained, and scientifically equipped rescue parties came at the time of the terrible Courtiers disaster in France when over 1,000 men lost their lives. For then a party with apparatus hurried from Germany and played a prominent part in the rescue operations. But unfortunately the glamour of their performance was somewhat dimmed by the fact that after they had done all they could and had gone home again, more men were rescued. Many, reading of the fact, were inclined to scoff at the new-fangled ideas, thinking that, after all, the old way of working with a party of brave but untrained and often ignorant volunteers was better than the new way of working with equipped and trained men. It certainly did seem as if the former had succeeded where the latter had failed, but that was quite a mistake, as subsequent events have shown and in all probability it was due to the fact that the uninstructed party were local men, thoroughly familiar with the mine in which they were working, its geography and its special local conditions, whereas the trained men came from far away. At all events the pioneer work of the Germans in the matter of rescue teams has been amply justified by the fact that other people have copied them, and none more thoroughly than the mining authorities of Great Britain. Indeed, we hear another incidence of the remarkable way in which the British people, though a little slow to take up a new idea, do take it up when it has once been established, and in such a way that they are soon among the foremost in its use. The Germans, all honor to them, started the rescue teams, but at this moment there are rescue teams and stations for their training in Britain second to none in the world. Of these there is a splendid example in the Rhoda Valley in South Wales, supported and worked by the owners of the pits in that district, besides others at Albdair in the same neighbourhood, and Mansfield to serve the collieries in Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, Indeed, rescue stations are now dotted throughout the mining districts. The general idea of these stations is as follows. The building is centrally situated in the district which is intended to serve, and in it are kept ample supply of necessary appliances, in the shape of breathing apparatus, which enables men to walk unhurt through poisonous gas, reviving apparatus, by which partially suffocated men can be brought round again by the administration of oxygen, together with quantities of that valuable gas in suitable portable cylinders. Everything which forethought can suggest as even possibly useful in an emergency is kept in constant state of readiness, and all the while a swift motor car stands ready to carry them to the scene of operations but the appliances are of little use without men to work them, who know them and can trust them. In the case of David, who felt able to do better work with his sling and stone than in all of the panoply of Saul's armor, because he had not proved it, is typical of universal human instinct. A man feels safer unarmed or simply armed than he does with the most elaborate weapons in which he has not learned to have confidence, and therefore the men who may be called upon to work this apparatus are first taught to have confidence in it. Each station has an instructor who is usually also the general superintendent of the station, and galleries in which the instruction can be carried out. Volunteers 
are called for in each colliery and a number of the most suitable men are chosen to undergo training preference being given very naturally to those who are already trained as fortunately so many workmen nowadays in ambulance work these chosen men then repair at intervals to the station to undergo a proper course of instruction the instructor often an ex non-commissioned officer of the royal engineers accustomed therefore to engineering matters and also to systematic discipline there puts them through a course of drill the object of which is to teach them to work together as a squad under the orders of a properly constituted chief thus when called upon in some emergency there will be no confusion but each man will know what to do and a few short words of command from the chief will serve better than the long explanations which would be necessary with an undisciplined body it welds the individual men as it were into a smoothly working machine thereby increasing the efficiency of the whole and arrangements are made whereby should the leader fail another man steps into his place of authority at once without question then having thus brought them under a suitable discipline the instructor takes his men to the experimental gallery this may be described as a long low narrow shed in which are timber props and beams rails on the floor heaps of coal all things in fact which may tend to make it closely resemble the actual workings of a coal mine after they have been shaken and shattered by the force of an explosion the great difficulty in a real disaster arises from what are known as falls the roof of the mine is normally supported by timbers and these the explosion moves so that in places many tons of the earth of which the roof of the mine consists will fall and block completely the roads or tunnels which communicate from the shaft to the places where the men are at work these of course have to be removed or burrowed through before the men imprisoned in the distant workings can be reached the rescue party does not of course wait to clear away the whole of the debris only just enough to enable them to crawl through or over it but even then it often represents the waste of precious hours and the expenditure of great exertions to get past a fall so at intervals falls are made in the gallery in order that men may be practiced in dealing with them it may be interesting to give a brief statement of the training undergone by the men at the mansfield rescue station in that case it should be stated the gallery is made double so that men can go one way and return the other back to their starting point having donned their breathing apparatus they enter the gallery which by the way is filled with smoke and foul gas passing along it they encounter two falls which they must get over or through then they have to set twelve timber props as might be necessary to maintain the safety of a damaged road in the mine all that they do three times over then they are required to bring up and lay two hundred and fifty bricks a thing which might also be necessary in an actual emergency after which they have to fix up bratis cloth in a part of the gallery one of the first duties of course for a rescue party is to restore the circulation of air in the mine and bratis cloth is a rough kind of cloth which is put to guide the air currents that done they have to take a dummy representing a man of fourteen stone put it on a stretcher and carry it round the gallery and over the falls finally they restore the timber bricks and cloth and their turn of work is done the total time required for this is two hours and during the whole of that period they are of course breathing not the natural air but the artificial atmosphere provided for them by 
the apparatus with which each man is provided. The chief point of this part of training, as has been remarked already, is to accustom the men to the wearing of the apparatus and doing work in it. By this means they gain confidence in it and get to know that it will not fail them in the time of trial. The course of instruction consists of ten drills such as has been described, after which the men are called up twice a year just to refresh their memories. One side of the gallery is glazed, so that the instructor can watch his men at work without of necessity of being inside himself, and there are emergency doors as well, which can be opened to let a man out should the ordeal be too much for him. The necessary fumes are generated in a stove and driven into the gallery by a fan. The stations are beautifully fitted up, with baths for the men to wash after their somewhat dirty experience in the gallery, and everything is done for the convenience and welfare. The advantage of this systematic training of a great number of men is that there are men at each colliery who can be called upon when needed. The team of strangers, as has been remarked, partially failed at courtiers, largely because they were strangers. But when every colliery has a team ready, composed of its own men, then clearly there is the greatest chance of success. The central station of the district is the training ground where the men go from all the collieries to get the experience and instruction and where a reserve store of appliances is kept. In many cases, of course, the collieries have their own appliances, so that work can be done at once, without having to wait that from the rescue station, but the latter forms a reserve in case of need and, being kept under the care of an expert, it is naturally always in the best possible working order. To give an idea of the cost of these stations, it may be stated that the one at Porth in the Rhondda Valley costs, including equipment, £7,000, while the one at Mansfield costs £3,000. This first cost and the expense of maintenance is borne by the collieries of the district in proportion to the quantity of coal which they raise. And now we can turn to the apparatus itself, without which the organization already described would be of little value. There are several makes of these, but a description of the particular apparatus used at the two stations mentioned will serve as an illustration. The purpose, of course, is to give the wearer an atmosphere of his own, which he can carry about with him and which will render him quite independent of the ordinary atmosphere and quite indifferent to the poisonous nature of the gases around him. To this end his mouth and nostrils must be cut off from the outer world altogether. There are two ways of doing this. In the one there is used a helmet, or perhaps mask would be the better term. This fits right over the man's face an airtight join being made between the helmet and his head by means of a rubber washer, which can be inflated with air. The inflation is accomplished by squeezing a rubber ball on the right-hand side of the helmet. In this center is a glass window through which he can see easily, and since this is apt to become clouded by the dampness of his breath, there is a wiper inside, which can be turned by a knob on the outside, so that by simply turning his knob with his hand he can clean the window at any time that may be necessary. Two soft pads inside the helmet bear one on the man's forehead and the other on his chin, and these working in conjunction with a strap which passes right round the back of his head, keeping the thing firmly in position. In addition, there is a combined with the helmet a leather skull cap, which, being continued down behind, gives good protection to the head and neck. The other form of apparatus consists of a mouthpiece and nose clip. The mouthpiece as its name implies, fits in the man's mouth, being supported and kept in position by a strap 
passing behind the back of his head. Combined with it is a little screw clip which closes his nostrils. The man also wears a leather skull cap from which straps depend to bear the weight of the mouthpiece and its attached tubes, so that the weight does not fall upon his mouth. Either of these arrangements, it is clear, cuts him off from communication with the outer air, but that is only half the problem, for he must be given a substitute or he will be suffocated. This part of the appliance he carries, knapsack fashion, upon his back. First there is a rectangular case called the regenerator, with, below it, two small cylinders of compressed oxygen. A suitable arrangement of pipes connects these together, and to the helmet or mouthpiece as the case may be. When the man exhales, as we all know, the air which he then discharges from his lungs is deficient in oxygen and instead contains carbonic acid gas. The latter must be got rid of and replaced by pure oxygen. The exhaled air is therefore led down a pipe to the regenerator, where it comes in contact with several trays of caustic soda, a chemical which has a great affinity for carbonic acid. The result is that the latter gas is extracted from the impure air, finding a more congenial home in the caustic soda. It is then necessary to restore the normal quantity of oxygen, and so, as the air passes on, it meets, in a little apparatus known as an injector, a spray of pure oxygen from the cylinders. Thus, after being purified and reoxygenated, the air passes on through more pipes to the helmet or mouthpiece, to be breathed once more. The apparatus contains sufficient oxygen and caustic soda for this to go on for a space of two hours. But during times of extra exertion a man needs more air than at others, for which provision has been made, and so on his chest the rescuer carries a flexible bag divided into two compartments. Through one of these the exhaled hair passes on its way to the regenerator, which through the other the oxygenated air flows on its way to the man's mouth. When he is breathing hard, then, during a moment of extra exertion, and when, therefore, he is turning out bad air faster than it can be purified, and drawing in pure air faster than it can be produced, this bag comes to his aid. From the store of oxygenated air in one side of it he draws the extra, which he requires, while the other side stores up temporarily the excess of viated air, until the regenerator is able to overtake its work. Thus, at all times, whether breathing ordinary or heavily, the apparatus can respond to his demands. The spray of oxygen as it escapes from the cylinders into the injector has the effect of driving the air along, so that the circulation through the tubes and the regenerator is automatic, and the foul air flows away from the man's mouth, and the new air comes back to him quite without effort on his part. As time goes on, of course, and the stored oxygen becomes used up, the pressure in the cylinders falls, which fall, shown upon a little pressure gauge, tells the man how much longer time he has before he must return for fresh supplies of oxygen and soda. Fresh cylinders of oxygen can be connected up very quickly in place of the empty ones, while a fresh regenerator can be put in, or new caustic soda supplied in a very short time. The superintendent of Mansfield Station has invented what is termed a self-rescue apparatus to be used in conjunction with that which has been described above. It is simpler and lighter than the rescue apparatus and will not keep a man supplied with air for more than one hour or an hour and a quarter. Moreover, it is not automatic since the flow of oxygen has to be controlled by the man himself, since, however, it consists only of a mouthpiece, a breathing bag, and a cylinder of oxygen, it is very portable, 
and may well be carried by a rescue party for the use of any man who might be discovered alive beyond the danger zone it may well happen indeed it often has happened that a remote part of a mine although cut off from the shaft by passages full of after damp as the foul gases caused by the explosion are termed may itself contain fairly pure air in which men can live for a long time if such men can be reached the difficulty is to get them through the passages containing the bad air consequently a rescue party which carried one or two of these light forms of apparatus could equip such men with them and then they could pass out with safety another use the one in fact from which the appliance draws its name is the facility with which by its aid a man could set right a chance defect in his ordinary rescue apparatus suppose for example that a fully equipped man found something wrong whereby he was prevented from getting his proper supply of purified air then if the party had one of the self-rescue sets with them he could slip off his helmet or mouthpiece quickly replacing it for a time with the self-rescue mouthpiece this might enable him to reach safety or even to put the other apparatus right and then don it once more the whole thing can be packed up into a small tin case which can be slung over one shoulder and with the oxygen cylinder slung over the other one the complete outfit can be carried quite easily by a man in addition to what he is wearing himself still another form of breathing appliance may well be taken on these rescue expeditions and that is the reviving apparatus for use upon those who have apparently ceased to breathe in this case a mask is put over the sufferer's mouth and nose and then the turning of a lever into a certain position causes oxygen to escape from a cylinder in such a way as to cause a suction which empties the man's lungs of the bad gases which have laid him low that done another movement of the lever and a deep breath of oxygen flows into his lungs in their place thus by alternating the positions of the lever an artificial respiration is set up far more effective than can possibly be attained by the ordinary method of moving the man's arms and pressing his chest indeed there are cases as such when the his arms or ribs are injured when the ordinary method is impossible but it is hard to imagine an instance when this beneficent apparatus could not be used and so long as there be any spark of life left in the poor fellow there seems to be every reason to expect a complete revival as the result of its use of course there are many other places where poisonous gases are likely to be met with such as gas works chemical works lime works and so on where this apparatus may be kept with advantage in case of accident indeed all that has been described above has its use apart from colliery explosions although they are the outstanding opportunities for its employment old workings tunnels which have been empty for a time sewers all these have on occasion to be entered not to mention houses full of smoke or factories full of chemical fumes all of which form cases in which the rescue apparatus would find useful employment end of section eighteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number nineteen of marvels of scientific invention this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c marvels of scientific invention by thomas w corbin 
how science helps to keep us well one branch of science medical science concerns itself almost entirely with health but it would be out of place to refer to such matters here even if the present writer were capable of doing justice to the subject a new medicine or a new method of operating upon a suffering patient would be quite correctly described as a scientific marvel but it is not of such that this chapter deals but rather with those great works by which the engineer often taught by the medical man promotes the health of a whole community most important of these perhaps is the provision of pure water some places are more fortunately situated than others in this respect being near streams flowing down from mountains clear and unpolluted which can be drunk after the minimum of purification others have to make use of the waters of a moderately clean river as london does those of the thames and the lee in which cases the greatest care has to be exercised in the filtration of the liquid before it can be sent out through the mains for domestic consumption in this particular domain invention has been comparatively slow there are novel pumps it is true for handling the water such as the humphrey gas pump which the metropolitan water board london have installed for filling their great reservoirs at chingford in these an explosion of gas is the motive force water flows by gravitation into a huge iron pipe closed at the top but open at the bottom it is so arranged that a quantity of gas shall be entrapped in the upper end which being exploded by an electric spark drives the mass of water out some of it together with a quantity of fresh water presently comes surging back entrapping a fresh supply of gas and causing a new explosion and so it goes on over and over again the particular pumps at the waterworks referred to discharge about fourteen tons of water at each explosion of which there are nine every minute the special effect of these machines however is not to improve the public health so much as to relieve the public pocket for their chief feature is that they work more economically than any other kind of pump the filters by which the water is purified are simply layers of sand much the same as have been in use for many years although in some cases chemistry is brought in and the work of the filters aided by the action of precipitants these are substances which combine in some way with the impurities in the water and carry them to the bottom of the tank or reservoir while the pure water remains to be drawn off from the top this is also the most usual method by which water is softened hardness in water is due to the presence of certain salts which are dissolved out of the ground as the water percolates through it and which are absent from rainwater to get rid of these the hard water has chemicals mixed with it in a tank from which it flows slowly through another tank the effect of the added chemicals is to convert the soluble salts in the water into insoluble particles which then tend to fall down to the bottom of the containing vessel the slow passage through the second tank is intended to give the particles time to settle finally to make sure that these have been all got rid of the water traverses a filter and then it is for all practical purposes as soft as rainwater some people are frightened of this artificially softened water on the grounds that chemicals have been added to it supposing apparently that when they use such water they are really employing a chemical solution that is quite wrong however for the added chemicals combining with the hardness form substances which are quite easily extracted from the water altogether 
if we liken the hardness to a number of pickpockets in a crowd and the added chemicals to a number of policemen who come to arrest the said pickpockets finally leaving the crowd free from both pickpockets and policemen we get a simple illustration of what takes place but almost equally important as the provision of pure water is the effective dealing with the drainage of a large town much offensive matter flows under the streets of our towns and cities and if it is not to become a nuisance it must be scientifically dealt with years ago the drains of london simply emptied themselves into the thames until in eighteen sixty four two large drains were constructed one on each side of and approximately parallel with the river to intercept the old drains and to carry their contents to points many miles down towards the sea even that however by no means abated the evil for it simply transferred it to a new place the river was as foul as ever william morris in news from nowhere pictures the catching of salmon in the thames off chelsea while one of london's prominent citizens referring to what was being done in the direction of purifying the river jocosely promised the members of parliament a little fly fishing at westminster equally remote it is to be feared from actual accomplishment these two prophecies do certainly indicate the tendency of events for science has enabled the authorities to relieve the long-suffering river of much of the pollution which they used to thrust into it the first great step was the introduction in eighteen eighty seven of a treatment in principle very like that just described for softening water the liquid from the drains is gathered into large reservoirs where chemicals are added to it causing the heavier matter to be precipitated in the form known as sludge the liquid portion or effluent as it is called which is left is discharged into the river just as the tide is ebbing so that it is carried right away and being comparatively inoffensive it pollutes the river very little indeed the sludge on the other hand is pumped into special steamers which carry it down to a certain spot off the thames estuary where they drop it into the sea the currents at the particular spot chosen are such that none of it returns to the river for a similar purpose electrolysis has been employed in this process the sewage is made to flow between two iron plates which are connected up to a source of electric current so that they form electrodes while the sewage is the electrolyte the current decomposes the liquid sewage causing chlorine and oxygen to be deposited upon that plate which forms the anode this deodorizes and purifies the sewage in addition to which iron salts are formed on the iron plates the effect of which is to precipitate the solid particles. Thus the same result is achieved as when chemicals are used, the main difference being that instead of chemicals being added, they are produced by the passage of the current. But from the scientific point of view, the most interesting process of all is that in which bacteria or microbes are brought into the service. The fact is familiar to most people that there are certain minute organisms which cause terrible diseases. It is not so well known that there are still more of them whose action is extremely beneficent. The writer has seen these minute living things described in a popular book as insects, but they really belong to a low order of plant life. and as has been said in an earlier chapter in spite of the lowliness of their status in the order of creation they are able to accomplish certain chemical processes which baffle the cleverest men they are particularly good or some of them are at any rate 
at forming compounds in which nitrogen forms a part. Further, they can be divided into two classes, the aerobic and the anaerobic. The former work best in air, while the latter need an absence of air while they perform their functions. After which preliminary explanation, we can proceed to describe how they are induced to carry on this valuable work for mankind. The sewage flows first of all into a tank from which light and air are excluded as far as possible. Then the anaerobic microbes flourish and multiply, and in the course of their life work, they convert the sewage into an inoffensive liquid. After an appropriate interval, the liquid passes to filter beds, where it trickles over and through beds of coke, the effect of which is to aerate it very thoroughly, whereby the aerobic microbes come into action, completing the good work, so that nothing is left except a clean, colorless, and odorless liquid. Indeed, it is more than that for the microbes have turned the offensive matter into nitrogenous compounds which, as we have seen in a previous chapter, are the best fertilizers. Hence this effluent, if placed upon the soil, is of great value. The advantage of this to towns which are not blessed, like London, with a broad river and the sea near at hand, needs no explanation. The bacteria necessary to carry on the process are always present in sewage, and after any particular plant has been in operation for a little while, there results an accumulation of them, so that the process becomes more and more active as time goes on. Mechanical ingenuity has so arranged matters that a sewage disposal plant on this system can be made quite automatic requiring little or no attention for months together, the raw sewage flowing in at one end while the odorless, harmless effluent pours out at the other. And moreover, so powerful is the action of these beneficent bacteria that should disease germs come down in the sewage, they soon destroy them. No chemicals are needed, for the bacteria replenish themselves, no sludge is left, everything being turned into the harmless effluent, and it may be said once more, disease germs are destroyed. Of all the valuable inventions of modern times, this is surely not one of the least. End of section 19. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Leo Smith. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin. Modern Artillery. Even as late as the time of the Crimean War guns, even the largest were made of that extremely common material, cast iron. In fact, so far as material went, there was no difference between a gun and a water pipe. It was the need for some material possessing strength comparable with that of steel, combined with the ease of production of cast iron, which led Sir Henry Bessemer to experiment in the manufacture of steel. Out of those experiments came Bessemer steel and its near relative, Siemens steel, two materials of universal application at the present time, so that to the needs of the artillerymen we owe two inventions which have proved of infinite value in peace as well as in war. If any particular piece of ordnance can be said to be the prime favorite with the English-speaking peoples, it is the big naval gun. With both British and Americans, the Navy takes pride of place. Both nations are given to contemplating with pleasure the number of dreadnoughts which they possess, and the distinguishing feature of a dreadnought is the large number of big guns which it carries. 
Of the latest of these gigantic weapons, one may not speak. But much is already public property concerning the 12-inch gun, which the original Dreadnought carried, and which is probably followed in its general features by the still greater guns of the most recent ships. A gun is spoken of by its caliber, which means the inside diameter, or, to use another expression, the size of the bore. So the 12-inch naval gun is 12 inches in the bore. Its length is in some cases 45 calibers, and in others 50 calibers. In other words, some are 45 feet long and others 50 feet. Why the difference, someone may ask. The answer is that the longer ones are an improved type. The extra length gives longer range and harder hits, as is quite apparent after a little thought. The explosive goes off and forthwith commences to drive the shell towards the muzzle. So long as it is in the gun, the shell is being pushed faster and faster. But so soon as it leaves the muzzle, the pushing ceases and the shell is left to pursue its course with its own momentum. Therefore, generally speaking, one may say that the longer the gun, the faster will be the speed of the shell as it leaves the muzzle. The farther it will go and the harder will be the blow at a given range. Incidentally, this explanation reveals the need for different kinds of explosive. The propellant whose function it is to drive the shell out of the gun is different from that with which the shell is itself filled. The former needs to act comparatively slowly so that it may continue its pushing action during the whole time that the shell is traveling along the gun. It might be ever so powerful, but were its action too sudden, it would simply tend to burst the gun without imparting very much speed to the shell. On arrival at its destination, however, the shell needs to burst suddenly and violently. Another interesting question arises at this point. Seeing how fast is even the slowest speed at which a projectile travels, how can it be possible to measure the rate at which a shell issues from one of these monster guns? Needless to say, it is electricity which makes a thing apparently so difficult really quite easy. Near the gun is set up a frame with a wire zigzagging to and fro across it in such a manner that when the gun is fired, the shell is bound to cut the wire. Electric current is made to pass through this wire on its way to a suitable house in which are recording instruments, where it energizes a magnet and so holds something up. Now it is easy to see that as soon as the shell cuts the wire, the current will stop, the magnet will let go, and the something will drop. At a certain distance farther on, there is a second frame with wires upon it through which passes a second current, which is also led to the instrument house, where it again operates a second magnet. When the first magnet releases its hold, it drops something, to wit, a long lead weight. When the second magnet lets go, it permits a second weight to fall against the first and make a dent or scratch upon it. The longer the interval between the action of the two magnets, the higher up upon the lead weight will the scratch be. The apparatus, in short, will register the distance fallen through by the lead weight between the breaking of the wire in the first frame and the breaking of the wire in the second frame. Now, a falling object, if only it has such weight that the resistance of the air is negligible, falls according to a well-understood law, which law it obeys with the utmost accuracy. Therefore, the distance fallen by the weight between the passage of the shell through the two points gives a very accurate record of the time taken to travel from one to the other. Of course, several such frames can be used if desired in the same way. But to return to the gun itself, it is not merely one piece of metal, but several tubes beautifully fitted one inside another. Moreover, in the British gun, at all events, between two of the tubes, there is a space filled with wire. This wire is perhaps better described as steel tape, and is of the finest material for the purpose, flexible and tremendously strong. It is wound round and round one of the tubes until there are many miles of it on a single gun. It is wound tightly, too, by means of special machinery. The purpose of the wire is to resist cracking. The solid steel tube may crack, and, as is the way with all cracks, these will tend to grow longer and longer. The many turns of wire, however, will not crack. Even if a few turns should break, the damage will not spread, 
and the gun can probably go on as if nothing had happened. The material of which these guns are made is nickel-chrome gun steel. Steel is ordinarily an alloy of iron and carbon, but this metal also contains traces of nickel and chromium, which make it specially suitable for its special purpose. Each of the tubes of which the gun is formed start as an ingot, a mere lump of metal, but roughly shaped. The requisite mixture is obtained in a furnace and the molten metal is run out into a mold. The ingot is heated again and pressed under enormous hydraulic presses until it is approximately the shape required. This pressing not only produces the desired shape, it also improves the quality of the metal. The rough forging is then bored out to make it into a tube. One is inclined to wonder why the ingot is not cast hollow to commence with, and so save the labor of boring it all out later. The explanation of this is that certain impurities are always present in the metal, and these always gather together in the part which sets last. Now in a solid block or ingot, it is clear that the center is the part which will set last, and hence that is the part where the impurities will congregate. Then, when the center part is all bored out, the impurities are entirely removed. The tube is shaped externally by being turned in a lathe. The innermost tube is not simply smooth. There is a spiral groove called the rifling, running round and round, screw fashion, inside it. The purpose of this is to give the shell a spinning action which causes it to keep point foremost throughout its flight. But for this, the shell would tend to turn over and over, resulting in uncertain and inaccurate flight. The shell is a little smaller than the bore of the gun, but near its base, it is an encircling band of soft copper, which band is a tight fit in the gun. The soft copper crushes into the rifling, whereby the shell obtains its spinning action. The large guns are mounted in pairs, each pair on a turntable, by the movement of which, to right or left, they are trained upon the distant target. The turntable is surrounded by a wall of thick armor and is covered by an iron hood or roof. In addition to being turntable to right or left, there is, of course, provision for raising or depressing the direction in which each gun is pointing. They need always to point more or less upwards, and the particular angle depends upon the range or distance of the object aimed at. This is ascertained by range-finding instruments and communicated to the officers in the turrets, as the covered turntables are called. The guns are then elevated or depressed to suit the range. Each gun rests upon a cradle, which is itself fitted upon a slide. When it is fired, it kicks backward, against the force of a buffer of springs, or hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder. Thus, after each shot, the gun moves backwards upon the slide, but the hydraulic apparatus brings it back again into position for firing almost instantaneously. In naval guns, all the movements, including that of the turntable, are by power, either hydraulic or electric, or a combination of the two. The loading is also by power. The shells and ammunition are kept well down towards the bottom of the ship, under each turret. Lifts bring them up from there to a chamber just beneath the turntable, known as the working chamber. Here a small quantity only is kept, and that for as short a time as possible before it's sent up by other hoists straight to the guns themselves. The hoists are so arranged that, no matter how they may be elevated or depressed, the ammunition is delivered exactly opposite the breech, as the rear end of the gun is termed. Then a mechanical rammer pushes it straight in. The breech of the gun is closed by a beautiful piece of mechanism called the breech block. It is really a huge plug which securely closes the end of the gun, a partial turn after it is in place fixing it firmly enough to resist all the force of the explosion. Yet it can be freed and swung back upon hinges in a few seconds. At the same moment that it is opened a jet of air blows into the gun, clearing out all effects of the recent explosion. The process of firing one of these guns may thus be summarized. The turntable is swiveled to right or left until the gunners, looking through the sights, which are really telescopes, see the objects straight in front of them. Meanwhile, the sights have been set according to the range. That is to say, they have been so set in relation to the gun itself that when they point directly at the target, the gun will be pointed upwards at exactly the right angle for that range. 
The whole thing, therefore, gun and sights combined, is tilted upwards or downwards as may be necessary until the sight points directly at the object aimed at. Then at a signal the gun is fired by electricity. The shock causes the gun to slide backwards upon its supporting slide, but the buffers, having taken the shock automatically, return it to its position again. The aim is thus undisturbed, and it is ready for the next shot. These enormous guns can be fired at the rate of one shot every 15 seconds. Field guns are in principle very similar to these, only, of course, they are much smaller and are mounted upon carriages, so that they can be quickly moved from place to place. It must be borne in mind, however, that there are, in the case of land guns, two distinct types. Field guns, like naval guns, fire straight at their target. Howitzers or mortars fire upwards with a view to letting the shell fall on the target from above. The latter are, generally speaking, short, fat, stumpy guns, as compared with the long, slender field guns. In the field, all guns have to be loaded by hand. The elaborate system of hoists which enables the great naval guns to be loaded with such rapidity is obviously impossible. That has to be compensated for by the skill and quickness of the gunners themselves, and it is indeed astonishing to see with what deftness they can handle the heavy and dangerous projectiles. With all guns, of whatever kind, range-finding is of the utmost importance. No projectile, however fast it may travel, really moves in a straight line. It must be fired more or less upwards in order to compensate for the downward pull of gravity. If the elevation is insufficient, the shell will fall short. If it be too much, it may go beyond the mark, or it may fall short, according to circumstances. Just the right elevation is absolutely essential for good shooting. And for that to be achieved, the range must be known with the utmost possible accuracy. There are various systems and instruments used for this purpose, but all depends upon the same principle. It is the principle underlying all surveying and all astronomy. Indeed, it is the only possible principle for measuring a distance when you cannot actually go and lay a measure upon it or by it. It is based upon a peculiar property of the triangle. In the case of every triangle which has straight sides, if we know the size of two of the angles and the length of one of the sides, we can easily calculate all that there is to be known about that triangle. We unconsciously use the principle when we judge a distance with our eyes. We focus each eye separately upon the object which we are looking at. In other words, each of our eyes looks along a straight line terminating in the object. Those two lines, together with a line joining our two eyes, form a triangle. The line between our eyes is the base, the line of which we know the length, while the directions in which we point our eyes gives us the angles at each end of the base. From this we are able to judge the distance of the object. Of course, there is probably not one of us who knows the length of that natural base in inches, but that does not matter in this case, since it is always the same whatever we may look at, and so the mere inclination of our eyes gives us a means of comparing distances. When we judge by the eye alone, what we really do is to draw upon our experience and consciously or unconsciously compare the distance which we are estimating with some others which we already know. In surveying, a telescope is set up at one end of a baseline and pointed first at the other end of the baseline and then at the distant object. A scale with which the instrument is provided gives us the size of the angle between the two. Then the same thing is done at the other end of the base, and the similar angle there is obtained. The length of the base being known, the distance of the remote object can then be calculated. In the same way, two observations can be made, one at each end of the ship, the length of the ship forming the baseline. Or an instrument can be made by which two observations can be made simultaneously by the same man. This is done by means of mirrors which are turned so that the same object is seen in both of them, apparently in a straight line. The extent to which one of them has to be turned gives the angle, and the instrument forms the base. Anyone with the slightest geometrical experience will perceive at once that the best results are obtained when the baseline is of considerable length, and hence small portable range-finding instruments such as can be easily carried and used by one man are necessarily less accurate than an arrangement such as has been suggested above, 
where two observers work simultaneously from the two ends of a ship. In many cases, however, the self-contained instrument is the only one which it is possible to use, and when the instrument is well made and in experienced hands, the results are surprisingly good. As used in surveying, for example, where the baseline may be anything, according to circumstances, and the angles may likewise vary at both ends, elaborate trigonometrical calculations have to be performed to arrive at the desired result. If, however, the baseline be always the same, and one of the angles be always a right angle, the distance of the distant object will vary within the remaining angle. Indeed, the scale by which that angle is measured can be made to give not degrees, but the distance of the object. Portable rangefinders, therefore, in many cases have one reflector set for a right angle and only one of the reflectors movable. The instrument then shows the distance of the object at a glance. This is impossible in the case of two separate observations on a ship. In that case, the base is always the same. But since the ship cannot be set at right angles to the object whenever a range has to be found, both angles have to be measured. There is, however, a beautifully simple little mechanism in which two pointers are set one to each of the two angles, and the distance is then shown instantly. The End of Chapter 20 End of Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin Read by Gary Leo Smith, Dublin, Ohio